hello again. It's your pal Mike Squires, and this is the Couchless Podcast, episode number two hundred and thirty-two. Two hundred thirty-two. I'm my guest and sort of boss and tour mate and musical brother Whitfield Crane, the lead singer of Ugly Kid Joe. Ugly Kid Joe, uh, the day that I'm actually recording this intro, released their new album entitled Rad Wings of Destiny, an obvious nod to their heroes, Judas Priest. Uh, And by the time you're hearing this, you can listen to it, stream it on all the platforms. You can download it on iTunes and go to uglykidjoe.net to find links to purchase uh, vinyl or cassette I think CD copies as well and go find tour dates for uh, the first two weeks of November in the UK and stay tuned for shows and uh, tour dates next year um, I have spent hours and hours I've spent many many hours speaking with Wit and he's one of my favorite people ever We talk about meeting the first time we met here and I was a reluctant, I was reluctant to, to be, to get down with wit. And there's just, uh, there was no denying that we were going to be tight. So I hope that you guys enjoy this conversation as much as I did, because for me, it's a joy every time I get to change words with him. So, uh, do check out Red Wings of Destiny. I will be on tour with the band again uh, over in the UK, and that has been a that's been a real joy for me. And it was a, an amazing thing for me to get to do this year. So, I owe uh, Wit and the rest of the band a real debt of gratitude. So, thank you guys. I love you. Um, what else? Uh, if you are enjoying the Couchless podcast, please, by all means. I would love your support on Patreon. I do a lot of stuff. And when you do a lot of things, you can't focus on a few things and do them the absolute best that they can be done. So while I'm doing my best at doing many, many jobs, I would rather do a more kick-ass version of my best at just a few things. And a growth in the Patreon would absolutely help me in so many ways there. So if you are already supporting, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Your support means a lot and does a lot. Um, If you're not and you're on the fence, there's no time like the present. Huh? Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Variety Coffee Roasters in Brooklyn, New York. Variety Coffee Roasters is what I drink every single morning. Every single morning, I drink it. Uh, I love it and so much that I actually buy it to brew on an industrial, like on an industrial level, for the coffee that I brew at work and put in cans. So I endorse their product in many, many, many ways, professionally and personally. If that, if my opinions mean anything to you, I would recommend going checking out. VarietyCoffeeRoasters.com. Follow them on at Variety Coffee Roasters on all the socials. They're great. Buy some coffee. Tell them I sent you. Get some merch. They also have their packaging is killer. It's killer packaging. You're going to love it. Looks like a carton of cigarettes. It's, it's awesome. Uh, if, you're, if you're old, I see, the, I see the demographics on the listeners here. So I know you guys know what a carton of smokes from the 70s looks like. Don't act like you don't know. Um, let's see what else. I think that's about it. Um, don't forget the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Can you even imagine? Here's here. I have this idea. I think we've had so many conversations and you've told me so many stories and they're almost exclusively amazing, but I don't. But I don't know what, I don't know what stories, you know, I don't, I don't know where your, where your comforts lie. So I, here's what I think. And I don't want to have just, I don't want to rehash. 
I don't want to simply rehash old stories. I want to talk about new stuff, sure. new stories, new experiences, but I also want to reference old yeah. stuff. So be you, bro, whatever uh, you are. Here's what I think. I think we should have a safe word. And if we start to go in, if we, if I ask about a certain story that I, I would want you to share, you can just use the safe word and we'll just move okay, on cool. and I'll, and I'll know to cut it there. What do you think Sounds about great. that? Awesome. What's your safe word? My safe word is hot sauce. Hot sauce. Great. What is your favorite hot sauce? I just bought this at the, at the, at the, oh. at the store. Oh, Sri Racha. Well, because I haven't had any, but I did buy this the yeah. other day. I went to saw, I saw this guy named C, CJ. He's made this hot sauce. Yeah. He plays in a band called the Wild Hearts, but it's too hot. Oh, yeah. I guess you could use it as like if it was something. I got this, but I don't, I'm not that into it. It's kind of a ball. Both, both these two are ball hogs. Like they're on the pitch and there's like five kids playing and the other four kids would be like whatever you're eating. And these guys are out. No, it's my, it's me, 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 me. And that's cool. If you want to burn your face off, which I'm into, yeah. but <laughs> it's not that bad. But this is probably the best one. So, that I have. Oh, to, I mean, Tabasco is, that's the shit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Tabasco is the shit. Yeah. Um, where are you at right now? I'm in Brighton. In the UK. That's right. Um, how's how are you enjoying it there? Um, it's the greatest place. It reminds me in um in the formative years of my musical career, I moved from my mom's house in nineteen eighty nine to a town called Isla Vista. Isla Vista is the most densely populated square mile west of the Mississippi. And it's also the college town for UCSB, University of California, Santa Barbara, right? And so all there was was in that town was all the fun at age, you know, let's say 19, 22, 23, right in there, right? And there's bicycles, and skateboards, and just kids that have just escaped their parents' house, you know, living out those various dreams, right? And one of the things that Isla Vista had, and probably still has, is you can walk everywhere. It's, it's that you don't need to go to a town or anywhere. So Brighton Hove, I'm actually in Hove. It's basically the same thing. You can walk everywhere and everything's here. Everybody's cool. Wide open minds. Um, 365 pubs. Uh, great gyms. It's right, <laughs> it, it, it's right on the sea. And there's freaks. Uh, there's freaks everywhere. Uh, and when I say freaks, I mean wide open minded, artistic people. There's, sure. there's a great pub I like to go to. My friend Mark Dodson. It's called the Paris House. There's all kinds of jazz in there. And you walk there. You walk there, and there's all the characters. You know, there's characters. There's every, In that pub, there's everyone from like a 80-year-old, 80 80 hilarious, like, you know, uh, eccentric guy, like an old, old man that's cool, to like 24-year-old kids. It's just the coolest place. I love that. Me too. So for, for, for people who are listening who are not familiar with people who are fans kind of know that you are a bit of a globe trotter, right? A what? A bit of a globe trotter. Yes, I'm always kind of moving through time and space. Um will you explain for people how it is you came to be in Brighton and also just sort of how you have chosen to live your life? Well, um I, I travel around with a backpack and I, uh, I'll live average like three months somewhere and then move on. Now, hopefully that's coupled with being a functioning and working musician. And when, when those two variables are together, I have the most joy in my life, which is right now. So everything's cool. Um, you know, so, I mean, I left my mom's house in 89, as I said, I went to Isla Vista and since then I just kind of been going every now and then I'll get a girlfriend and, and live with a girlfriend. And then, um, you know, and those have been cool experiences and then I'll move on from that. And, you know, statistically, I just am interested in seeing the world, you know, there's so, I mean, as far as human history goes, this is a pretty cool time to have been born or exist, you know, with, you know, and the airplanes or credit cards or it's, you can go, you I mean, you and I could agree to go to the Amazon right now and be there in 72 hours 
and come back right. and do another like interview. <laughs> you know, so it's it's just it's, it's so also I'm, the lowest risk of being eaten like by a predator. Yeah, so probably you know, for in me, I, and I'm and just so you know, Mike, I'm not I'm not really thought out. So you know, I don't. I've never. I don't. I just kind of roll through, and what feels good to me, I'll embrace, and hopefully get creative, and meet cool people that I've never met, and uh, you know. So I've been doing this uh, for thirty years ish, yeah, at least. And yeah. what's cool about it is, is the uh, you know, I mean, I would, I've always like, you know, I'll invite my friends or whomever. I'm like, come on, let's go. But no one will really go, and I get why. You know, they have their lives, and so because. I'm a social being, a gregarious soul, right? Which I just am. I will go alone. And because my need for human interaction, I'll make whole lives wherever I go. So right now I'm in Brighton Hove and I have a whole crew here and everyone's cool. You know, you go to the pub or you could get a gelato. You could go see some jazz or go to the gym. You could be a vegan or you could get a steak and you could walk everywhere. Right. So when I leave, without everyone, you know, when I leave, well, then there's a place to come back to and so on. So there's a bunch of different places that I've uh, lived where I have, you know, like many, many families. That's kind of an experience. What's the place? What's the place that you've visited the most, and and what place have you not been that you that you'd really like to visit, well, or that you're thinking floated, about like, on the pre horizon? Pre-pandemic, I was floating around Europe a lot, like wherever, mm -hmm. wherever I would end up, like whether it be Italy or France or Portugal. Um, but during the pandemic, I lived in Costa Rica. So I lived in a town called Santa Teresa, and I lived in a, San, a town called Manuel Antonio. I guess since May 2nd, 2010, I've been going to Costa Rica a lot, you know? So in May of 2010, I, it was time for, to, for me to piece my life back together. I didn't have a band. Um, didn't really have anything. And I was like, fuck, you know, what should I do? So I went to Costa Rica to get my shit together and did. And since then, have pieced my life back together. And as I said before, one of the great components that I really am grateful for when it's here is, is it being a working musician, being a functioning, you know, it's, it's one thing to be able to, you know, be able to sing or play guitar or drums or piano or whatever, but it's another thing to be able to go do it and tour with it. So, um, I spent the most time, I think probably in the last 12 years, probably in, um, Costa Rica. When you say piece your life together, you mean your musical life. You're saying you didn't have a because you were still traveling around and you're still wit crane. No, no. You go. Was, once again, that, that that every now and then I'll sign up for, you know, uh, a, a, a loving relationship. So like every now and then I'll get a girlfriend, and I'll say, okay, maybe I should be doing that because it it seems like a good idea sometimes, and um, and I will go. <laughs> <laughs> it does it does seem like an awesome i mean yeah. people are around uh and so in 2010 i was the end of a relationship and on february 18th 2010 i left that and at that time so then i didn't have that relationship right where like i had to i really had to have i don't know if the word's courage but i had to have the uh fortitude of some kind to end that which was the right decision and then I literally didn't have a band, didn't have a girlfriend, and was completely depressed, which was, you know, that was by my own hand, and it was actually important to feel that, you know? So I leaned into that, and I thought to myself, like, wow. And, like, my musical career certainly seemed like a, a weird dream that maybe or maybe had not happened. I mean, you could look at something, you could look at like a live show on YouTube and be like, okay, it did happen, but, it, it, you know, it wasn't happening. So, right. you know, um, you know, I created all that, and uh, I think it's important that I leaned into it. And I, I, um, you know, I went to Costa Rica and dried out, and really thought about it, and thought about, you know, could I put this band back together? Could I be in a band? You know, um, and you know, baby steps. You know, one day at a time, as they say, to get your life back into you know fighting shape. And so now, I mean, you've been on the the journeys with me. You've been on your own travails, as as they say, and. Uh, yeah, I had to piece it back together. Well, I didn't have to, but I did. How hard was it, and like, what was the process like to sort of get the band together, rally the troops, so to speak? Well, Dave Fortman, the guitar player for Ugly Kid Joe, has produced a bunch of Godsmack records. 
Shannon Larkin, right. the drummer for God's Back, was in Ugly Kid Joe during like Menace to Sobriety and um, Motel California. Ugly Kid Joe broke up or stopped playing music, however you want to word that, in, I would say, late December 96, January, February 97, right? And that was that. Uh, after Ugly Kid Joe had become defunct, or whatever the wording is, um, I would, every couple, like Klaus and I grew up together. The, the guitar, the left-handed guitar player, Klaus Eichstein. We grew up together in Palo Alto, California. We're childhood friends, which is pretty cool. And, you know, we just, after the Ugly Kid Joe band broke up, we just went back to being friends. It was no problem. We have the same, you know, friends. We have the same life experience. We, you know, everybody knows each other. So we just literally went back to being friends, which was, which was pretty awesome. And every couple of years, I would lean into Klaus, and I'd say, "What?" and he'd know what I was going to say. I'd say, what do you think? And he'd be like, no. He'd just give me the straight no. And I'd be like, okay, <laughs> fair enough. And so you'd have to ask Klaus why he was, you know, like not into it, which is fine. Anyway, so about 14, 15 years, I was like, I guess it'll never happen, which is fine, you know. But then, you know, there's part of me that always wanted to, you know, play more music um, with, with those guys. And uh, anyway, so Dave Fortman was producing – a Godsmack record, I would think. And then I think those guys were just shooting the shit. And then, you know, because Dave Fortman had a studio. He's a badass producer. You know, we all love each other. And they were like, we should just go make an Ugly Kid Joe record for fun. And um, so they called Klaus. They're probably around, I would imagine, 2010, 2011. And said, hey, what do you think? And I, 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 for whatever reason, that was attracted to Klaus. And then all of a sudden... All the all the pennies dropped. That we all went in and made a record, Stairway to Hell, which was really fun. And uh, during that process, we actually uh, became really tight with Sunny Mayo, which, which we, of course we love. And um, how's that description? Do you think Klaus just wanted to be asked by Dave and not you? <laughs> I mean, obviously. <laughs> I mean, on a chessboard, that's what it would be. I mean, but then again, mm -hmm. I mean, Klaus has probably had enough of me, you know, and just in general. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, he's just, you know, if, if you have me just pecking at you your whole life, you know, you don't really want to hear any more of it. You're like, no. <laughs> so, so, I mean, better late than never. So, it's it's been it's right. been really, I, you know, I mean, I heard an interview with Johnny Depp years ago, and he said, uh, nothing ends well. And I went, oh, wow, that's heavy. And I really thought about it. And statistically, I think he's dead on, like on a chessboard or a, or a gauge, a mathematical gauge, is probably 98% of things just don't end well. Marriage doesn't end well. A loving relationship doesn't end well. Bands don't end well. You may be your job. When does your job end well, right? So Ugly Kid Joe didn't end in a horrific way. No one was um, salty and mad at each other. We just, you know, we stopped. And um, right. And so, but nevertheless, it, even, even that said, even though it wasn't tumultuous or angry or toxic the end um it was still an end that like you you kind of like you know you did seven years with these guys it, it was you know it's, it's it's your life so it's really interesting and tough to let go of such a journey and of course you know by necessity you had to so for us to get together years later i mean years later 14 15 years later it's been cathartic it's been, I mean, for me, I can only speak for me. So it's been really healthy for me. Um, uh, I really love the, the family of musicians that have, including yourself, that have come to help the quest of, of Ugly Kid Joe. Um, and it's just been, um, you know, it's been healthy and awesome. And there's closure in it no matter what now. Like, no matter what happens, like, no, I, I'm not like, oh, when we've come back, like, oddly, and um, it's impressive to me, uh, the band's been together now. And we, our first show back, like an actual show with an album and everything, was June 6, 2012 in London. So before that, obviously, we'd been making the Stairway to LEP. But anyway, if you just gauge it on that first show, June, July, August, September, October, that's 10 years, four months, and, you know, eight days or nine days, right? So that's longer than the seven years we played in the first place. So, you know, and, it's, right. and you've been out there. Like, how fun is it to go out, get on the bus? All the guys play clubs it's the or, best. Or, 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 you know, festivals or whatever. Like, it's just, you know, we're really grateful to be able to do it. At least, I mean, I'm super psyched to get to go, yeah. to get to. 
No, it's the best. It is absolutely the best. Um, so when when the the troops when the, when you got the team back together, right? Yeah. And you're you're making that recording. What's the vibe? Be, and is it is it different than before? Because now you guys have had a bunch of time apart, and you're you're recording some new music. You made an EP. Yeah. Which I I still listen to. It's so good. Yeah, the EP's killer. I think it's it's my favorite Ugly Kid Joe release. Oh, good. Actually, oh. like I just think co- like collectively, it's uh, yeah, I just think it's great. So. What's what is the vibe? Are you guys fully re-energized and excited, or is there any hesitation? Are you guys just all in? Well, there's an innate quality to people that you've had that much experience with, as you well know, right? So, yeah. um, the only piece of that puzzle that would have been suspect or challenging was people people being non-committive or, or not committing to. The process, but the, but let me tell you, when we when Klaus finally said it's on, it was on. Like there wasn't, you know, there wasn't anything in his eyes that was like, hey, I don't know. He was like, fucking, let's go. So you know, we started right. songwriting and woodshedding and getting, you know, getting rad as we could. And uh, you know, Shannon was in. He was like, fuck yeah, I'll do that. And then the interesting part of that story, which I find really awesome, is there is a really great currency for me to this day is Sunny Mayo. So Sonny May, I mean, I mean, Dave's off in Louisiana. He hasn't, you know, and so we started making this EP, Share With a Hell, in L.A. And Sonny, at that time, and probably till now, was, you know, he's a producer type dude. So we said, Sonny, do you know where to go do this? Shannon's going to fly in. Are you into it? And he's like, yeah, I guess. And Sonny, he, he, you know, at that time, he kind of gave me a look like, who's this motherfucker? Which was me. And he never really understood right. <laughs> me, which is fair. A lot of people don't. I accept that. Um, but during the process, he, like, he got he got me you know and i got him we really connected through music uh beautifully enough and um and so we made most of that ep in la i forget the little studio little teeny studio that sunny had uh, access to you know the we had uh, we did a song called um love ain't true where you know i literally had a dream i was, i dreamt that fishbone came played horns on it and uh and Sonny's like, I know those dudes. And they came and played horns on it. And they were fucking awesome. <laughs> so everything kind of, you know when things are going going where they should go? You know when like you write a song and it's effortless? And you know how some other yeah. songs are like, this is going to be fucking killer, but it just doesn't want to be written? So there's things that flow and there's things that don't flow. So what it was like to put it back together is it wanted to flow. There was a lot of great chi, a lot of great energy. Um, and once again, it was cathartic energy, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we did what we could do. And then we flew over, uh, to Louisiana and it was awesome. There was Dave Fortman, you know, mixing it up on a giant need board that he owned. And there we all were together. Now it's one thing and I bet you have this with the various bands you've been in, but you know, I don't know. I, I, for me, it's one thing to have, a to be in a band with someone for yeah, X amount of time, let's say seven years, right. In the storyline. You now it's one thing to love on the people in the band, whoever they may be, and then go meet them for dinner. But you're not in a band anymore through the years. You're hey, then we'll meet up for sushi, right on. right? And, that, and right. you should go do that. Or let's go to a ball game or whatever it may be. You want to meet at the bar, whatever you may do. That's one way to roll. But there's always something missing at those dinners or at the ball game. It's nice to see your friend, hey, and you do love them. And there's a different energy flux for me when you're being creative with those people, with those band members. It's an innate right. and subtle quality that I really love. So now, you know, when we went and when we went and made that EP and in you know, and we mixed it up in New Orleans, all that energy was there. We just weren't meeting to go to the bar. We were meeting to make some music. And it was all there. And it was all and we and with Dave being, you know, Dave's a badass producer. So he knew it, and so it was all it was just us. And you know, Dave's actually a, a great psychologist too. And you, I guess you have to be to be a producer, you know, because everybody's crazy. Right. So he uh you know, it was just fun. It was fun. And, you know, there's beers and, you know, we made a cool body of music and we went and toured it. Now, that doesn't mean people are going to go see your band after 15 years. You know, <laughs> I got the, you know, like the Blues Brothers, we got the band back together, right? That doesn't mean shit. So we went and um, we've toured around the world since then, since 2012. And people do go see the band and people do celebrate uh, the band. And that feels really good. Um, just because you're part of something, you know, and, the, and you have an outlet for 
your, you know, yourself and in, in the band. Like it's rad to connect. When I look at Klaus on stage, I mean, you've been up there now. I look at him, I'm all, there he is again. And he's, he looks at me like, yep, there he is again. <laughs> and it's just. Let's so. talk about that. Let's talk about the part, the touring part, when you got back together and you're like, all right, now we're going to play our first show in who knows how long. You and I have had conversations about, well, maybe this is going to happen. Maybe we'll do this and hope, you know, there's always this element of, um, is it going to be rad? Are people going to show that's up? Right. Well, but I felt are like they, that. I, are they I not going to show felt up? I like that for my whole life. Like even in 92, when we were selling out like theaters and like, like doing 8,000 tickets in Australia, I would look at my tour manager, Billy Morgan and say backstage at sold out shows, I would say, I don't think anybody's going to the show. And he'd be all, it's sold out and it'll be all fit. No one's going to go. So I never think people are going to go to any show. So you're, you're, you're pretty much outside, like handing out handbills, like, Hey, come see my band tonight. Just like that. Sorry. Sorry. The show's sold out, but come to the show. Yeah, no, I just, you know, I, you, you <laughs> wish, you know, you're as an artist, you know, you feel really small, right? right. You don't feel like a big tiger. I mean, we can perform and kick ass on stage, but it's, you know, you know, I, I feel super small, uh, most of the time. And I want, you know, and so of course you want something that mirrors success. And, you know, one form of that success could be a full room that feels really good. And you, you can really dance with that energy in a room. Right. And one of the other things from a business prowess is if there is a full room, it leads to more shows. So if no one's going to these fucking shows, you're not getting more to tours. Shows. <laughs> and so it's like, it's like, it's just like, there's this thing that's all, it's just, it, there's a bunch of different roads and you know, and they're all important and they're all disposable, you know? Um, well, people showing up at your shows doesn't just, it's not just a, some sort of ego sort of thing. It's not like, well, I guess I'm, I'm not that killer. It's also a part of the machine that helps you, the business of your music. Yeah, yeah, there's two things. There's the art and the continue. business, which have always been a strange marriage, but I'm good at it now. I mean, we manage ourselves. Right. So, you know, I mean, shows are, it's my favorite thing, like this interview or the writing of songs or, um, you know, doing a video or whatever you do, it all leads to hopefully being on tour. Tour is my favorite place ever. Yeah. Um, um, though my newest conclusion here, which I've always been doing, but now I have a wording for it, um, is I love the process of it all. Like I love, um, watering the roots of a musical flower i mean i love it it's so you know like i just went and tracked a song with these guys here in this town about denzel washington yesterday <laughs> and, and i love it you know what i mean so it's just so fun to have a process for me that i'm in love with and sometimes someone will you know give you a couple bucks and most of the time they won't but i'm still gonna do it <laughs> <laughs> but you know right. what i mean i'm still gonna do it no matter what and and the thing that music has brought me, and I would imagine you and whomever's close to it, and that could be a, a you know, the, the merch guy or the bus driver or the techs or the bass player or the singer, manager, whatever all the different characters are. It brings us all together to have these collective experiences. Um, and I love that process. Like when you walk into a studio and you you know, maybe some pre-production under your belt and you're going to track a song, that's a really alive moment. And what a wondrous process. You know, um, of yeah. course, as I said before, I mean, I love it when we get on that tour bus. I mean, I love it's that. pretty great. It's the greatest. There's a bunch of guitars, some making it through the plane flight, some not. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so when you guys go out on tour for that EP, right? Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to cruise back to the uh, what was that? 2012. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Was it 2012, 11? Yeah. That's when we met. Right. We met on, August, we met on October 24, 2012 in um, Wales. Right. Just like Jonah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have to be honest. I was like, all right, here's, here comes these guys. Here comes the ugly kid Joe band. <laughs> We have a we have a dressing room with a border between us, right? Yeah. With like a retractable wall. And I was just like, oh, these guys are gonna be loud, obnoxious partiers or something. 
And uh, the first day that we were on tour together, and, and I, that was just me being, uh, for just failing at being a, an open social human. You just took the wall down and walked in and just, it was on. And it, five minutes in, I was like, I was absolutely in love. I was like, these are my people. And we were like, uh, not inseparable on that tour, but we spent a lot of time and walked around yeah. and... And we've been friends ever since. That's correct. We were supposed to share a bus, or it was proposed that we share a bus. I, st I still don't think it would have been a great idea to share a bus. Right. Two bands on a bus is too much. Yeah. I don't care how much money is saved. But um, let's talk about that tour a little bit. Well, it was um, loaded with your buddy Duff McKagan. It was Alice Cooper. Yeah. Who's awesome? What a neat dude! Yes, and it was Ugly Kid Joe. We had not done a proper tour. That was a pretty big tour, and um, the lineup was Duff McKagan and Loaded, then Ugly Kid Joe, and then uh, Alice Cooper. The tour started, um, I believe, October twenty fourth in Wales, and I think it ended up in Sheffield on November third. And we played some one offs too, like just club shows with each other. Um. As you said, I was like, we were all excited to meet Duff McKagan. You know, we love Guns N' Roses. We're like, holy fuck, we're going to get to meet that dude. How rad. And so the first show, there was that partition or whatever you want to call it between us. And I was, I could hear you guys. And I'm, I'm more interested in meeting people than having a, a wall. And I think I stuck my head through or something. I said, you guys mind if I pull this down? And, and you guys were like, fuck yeah, pull it down immediately. So we pulled the wall down. And it was just, there we were in a big room. So from that moment on, we, the two bands, the Loaded Band and Ugly Kid Joe, we shared the dressing rooms. We shared, you know, whatever we shared, you know? And it yeah. was an immediate and awesome connection. It was Zach Morris's first gig in Ugly Kid Joe. And Phil... Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, first gig ever. And Phil Campbell was there, <clears throat> and he plays in Motorhead and um, at the time. And, um, and I'm like, well, fuck yeah, because I'm excited to connect. I mean, I'm convinced that we're all in one big band, just so you know. I'm, that's what I think. We have little different brands, but we're all just one big collective waiting to rock. And uh, anyway, I said to Phil, I said, Phil, you want to play Ace of Spades? And he's all, I guess. And then I'm like, hey, Duff. And I didn't even know Duff. I probably hadn't said five words to that guy. I go, you want to play Ace of Spades tonight with Phil? It'll be rad. <laughs> he goes, yeah, fine. That'd be awesome. And I walked up to Zach, poor Zach, who's rad that he pulled it up. I go, hey, Zach, just so you know, for your first show, he's like, yeah, what's up, boss? I go, so Phil Campbell, he plays in a little band called Motorhead, and then a uh, the little guy, the taller guy, uh, Duff McKagan, he plays the Guns N' Roses. They're going to jam uh, Ace of Spades with us. Just don't fuck it up. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and it was Was awesome. Ace of Spades already in your rotation, or was it a uh, song no, that I, you guys I, I don't remember that sometimes part. did? We had, it, we had it in us somewhere, um, but we played it, and it was awesome. So that was cool. And then the, yeah. the shows, and then that was just, you know, an immediate synergy and connection and, you know, love. Uh, people and music and all that and um then we toured and it was awesome and fun and sunny was in the band and we all got along and we all you know would go see things in the cities you know go to, when you're in Prague, yeah. like really walk off into the distance and everyone was clear-minded so there wasn't a bunch of hangovers to negotiate which was cool um yeah. and you know uh for me, I was a hooray, I get to sing again, yay, because that feels really good just for me as a performer and an artist and, you know, what I believe I kind of born to do. But also, um, there we were immediately friends with new people, and I love people, you know, and it was fun, and we were totally fucking connected. So I just remember it being um, a really positive experience. How... Tell me how it felt because you know there in the back of your mind there's like maybe bunk maybe maybe the EP comes out I go on tour no I wasn't worried cares. for that because it's Alice Cooper if Alice Cooper's headlining there'll be people there right it wasn't on me right well I guess there is that thing where I mean when I see you whether I'm on stage with you or not and I, and I know you're going to go on stage I know doesn't matter you're going to be fine. In front of any crowd, I don't care what the crowd is. Right, like you're gonna, like you belong in front of people. Is what I <laughs> Thanks, think. Thanks, man. I, you do. Thank you. 
I accept that. What What do you think it is inside of you? And has it always been? Like, do you think that it's something that sort of developed? Or do you think it's has always been in you that you, like, maybe you should have been in front of people earlier even? Do you think, what is it that makes, allows you to be as comfortable as you are in front of people? Like, where do you go in your head? Well, the second I heard heavy metal music, I was touched in a way that I've never been touched. Like, I've done drugs, I've drank beers, you know, I've been, you know, I've had a lot of hedonistic experiences. But just the sounds of heavy metal music, just the sounds of Black Sabbath or Van Halen 1 or Iron Maiden or Priest, like just those sounds when I first heard them opened me up to this incredible thing, like this resonance. Like it was all, ooh, like it was something. So I think it was, you know, rock and roll heavy metal music that when I heard it, I was like, wow, like it, it spoke to me. And it spoke to a lot of kids in North America, I would, I would, I would imagine. That's what Glenn Tipton says. He said, North American safe priest. And uh, so I would think that would be the start of it. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I genuinely loved it. So and I still love it. I'm in love with it. So I really wanted to be in a band. I wanted to be a guitar player. Klaus and I actually started uh, guitar lessons the same day from this guy, Ken Brown, who lived in uh, yeah. East Palo Alto. And I told my mom, I said, Mom, I'm going to be a guitar player. I can be 14. I'm going to be a guitar player. It's on. And she said, oh, really? She's a piano player. She goes, oh, really? Single mom at this point. She goes, really, are you? And I go, yeah. I need a Marshall stack. I need to, basically whatever's in this picture, I need it immediately. And I thought you could just get, at that point, I really thought if you had the gear, you would play Eruption. Like, it would just happen. And she said, uh, wow. Right. She goes, well, why, would you, why do you need all that? I go, because it's, 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 I'm going to shred, obviously. And she's yeah. like, no, we'll start you with acoustic. We'll start you with an acoustic guitar. And I was like, really? And I was so mad about it, like a little childish, 14 year old kid. And she sent me <laughs> off to uh, Ken Brown. And I learned a blue scale. And I, I was like, hey, there's Klaus. Like, we walked in the same door. And of course, Klaus kept on to it. And my soul, my heart, I'm probably a guitar player, really, let's be honest. But my attention span then and now is, you know, small. So I uh, really wanted to play. And be in a band with Klaus. Klaus could play Eruption in his house in Palo Alto. And his sister would have parties, uh, high school parties. And we'd keep Klaus would shred on his you know, his guitar that he made in wood shop. And I would kind of pull him aside. I'd say, Klaus, dude, I'll be the singer. And he'd go like this, nah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, nah. I don't even think he'd say anything. He just didn't respond. So, you know, I, I, I think I became a rock singer by default of really just wanting to be in a band. Not quite sure what it represented, probably needing attention at that macro attention that someone would need, you know. Um, I'm at, Did I you imagine, take any voice lessons? I went, or do, I, went, are you... I went to, funny enough, I went, I was like, okay, this is interesting because I think psychosomatic qualities are really important based in the story. So um, my mom was always really cool. Like, you know, if, she, if I would do anything vaguely positive, she would support it. You know, one Christmas, yeah. there was a Tascam Porta 1 under the Christmas tree, an SM58 under the Christmas tree, a skill saw, some pots and pans, lamps. <laughs> like, she, um, on one hand, she was like, you want to follow your rock journey? That's rad. Here's some tools for your probably carpentry destiny. <laughs> and here's some right. pots and pans and a lamp for when you leave. <laughs> Right, <laughs> you know, but I didn't get. I, I didn't really understand. I said, like, "Why do we have pots and pans?" I didn't. I didn't understand. But anyway, um, I really wanted to be in a band. And later, when I was living in Santa Barbara, I was, I was, uh, you know, I started a heavy metal band that later becomes Ugly Kid Joe with these guys. And uh, and then for some reason, I heard about this. Uh, you know, you know, GIT, like it's Guitar Institute of Technology. And yeah, there's, of course. In, but there's also, there's part of that's called VIT, right? Where right. the vocals would go. So I heard about that and I was like, and I really, and there's not one form of school I've ever wanted to go to. Not really. Mm -hmm. I come from an academic family, but you know, it's not for me. And um, so I went to this vocal school of it, whatever it's called. And I went there and I was like, a rat, I'll do it. And I went, this pertaining to, did I, did I go? And of course my mom subsidized that with my grandma. And they're all, yes, anything, please do something. So I went there 
and I certainly didn't know anything, not that I know anything now, but, but, but as far as experiential constellations, I didn't have any experience. So I went to this vocal school and it was, you know, I was like, this is really weird. Like you're singing home on the range. Where's the metal? You know, and I was like, okay. And the guy was like, you had to hold the mic stand a certain way. You had to do all these weird things a way. And I wasn't sure if that was true or false, but I didn't feel right. And so right. slowly but surely about, you know, a little more than half, uh, which would be my normal reaction to any academic or scholastic endeavor. I was like, fuck this. And I went back to Santa Barbara. But funny enough, I was still singing in this cover band I was in and everybody came up to me and said, dude, I go, what's up? No, you, that fucking school, you sound fucking awesome. And I'd be like, really? And they'd be like, amazing. Like it's night and day. And so I don't believe that the school really taught me any fundamental vocal, um, you know, techniques, but the fact that my, I imagine my subconscious and, and, and going through a ritual of some sort, which was like, I went to a school to celebrate this quest I'm on, which is, I want to be a singer, which made me probably my subconscious more than the version right now, believe that I was going to be a fucking singer. Then I just needed one person to say, you sound awesome. And then I believed it more. Then I became good. <laughs> I can't believe I've known you for 10 years and I've never heard the story of you going to the vocal Institute. So how, how long did you last Not before long. you under were half, like, under half of it. it was, I didn't feel comfortable. In, I mean, I've never really fit in anywhere, but Hollywood was a big stretch for me. And right. uh, funny enough, when I became successful, as far as like, you know, MTV and record sales, they put me in their brochure. <laughs> <laughs> you too oh that's amazing six success stories from the vocal institute well they're part of the journey i guess yeah yeah right it that's so crazy to me yeah huh okay so you go back and i mean surely do you really believe that ta like time honored classical training W like didn't assist you in some way other than just being a step in your journey like surely it it informed some of your technique whether you no, not that no. school no way i went to other school because you what you want no it didn't do shit it, but i said I, for me it's committing to so any of your listeners or viewers or whatever it's important to do i think you know uh north america lacks ritual you know our gods are pretty boring kind of divisive right, right? So there's no ritual there for me, so respect to whatever it is, right? So you kind of make your own ritual. So if you find actually just day to day, you kind of invent your own bullshit, right? So if you find something sure. that you're excited about, it could be, you could be a chef or a singer, or you can make a sandwich or you could do whatever you're doing. It could be anything, <laughs> an athlete, right. whatever, um, whatever, uh, you know, uh, it's important, at least for the, the, the message I got out of my experience, which I've just said before is it's important to commit to do something. And then you as a human being, and I would imagine your subconscious holds on to that because it's, it's picked something. You've watered that flower. And then there's a chance, if there's a chance at all, that it can bloom. And that's what happened miraculously. But I didn't learn anything. What about I didn't learn how to sing from them. No way. I learned how to sing from Bon Scott, Rob Halford, uh, Ozzy Osbourne, um, Bruce Dickinson. Those are my like vocal teachers. For right. sure. I mean, I would sit in my mom's house and sit there forever, you know, singing that and, and breaking a sweat with a Donne tennis racket, rocking out like 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 taking the paint off a Donne tennis racket because I was I was all the guitar players and the singer all day long. My right. mom would open the door and just be like, "Wow!" Because I'd be drenched. Like I was in all the posters in my room. I was like, I was in these bands straight up. Right. I was. You ever seen that? What's that? What's that? What's that uh, movie called? The Metal Years? Is it called The Metal Years? E, the uh, the Spheris uh, one. The the uh, it's about it's all like, those heavy uh, metal bands in the eighties. It's a movie. Yeah. What's it called? Yeah, it's a documentary. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a <laughs> there's a moment in that where they interview one of the bands. It might have been the band Odin. I forget which band it was. And the, and and they're, they're in a hot tub and they're you know they're living it right. Yeah. And the, it might have been Penelope Spears, maybe. I forget who her name is. Um, yeah. She asked one of the, the singer, which might as well have been me. And she was like, what are you going to do if it doesn't work? And he was like, it's going to. It's just going <laughs> to, you know? And you can see how hilarious that answer is. But funny enough, I had that exact answer. 
throughout my life. It's just going to be great. And so, you know, many are called, few are chosen, as they say. And, uh, you know, I'm you aware, have to I, believe it's going to work. Otherwise, why do it? Right. So miraculously, it worked. What about once you once you are on tour and you're playing every night and you you don't have technical training and so you're using your voice every night are you are you then later like reaching out to a vocal coach or are you like in touch enough with your voice where you're like okay that doesn't work and it hurts and has negative impact on the next night i have to figure out how to do that differently um well, I think my, my, the fuel of that answer is that I'm pretty lazy. I want, I want a minimal condition for whatever moment in time and space, right? Including singing. So I went to that vocal school and I also went to some famous LA vocal coach and he, I went and he went, la, la, la. He had this warm up that you're supposed to do before your, before your every game. And he gave me a cassette right. tape. And I was all right, yeah. I'm going to be the guy. And I would be, be like, all right. And I would sit there and I'd be like, Shh, to my band member, I gotta fucking do this, you know. <laughs> you know, I'd be this kind of prissy, um, self important, and but more importantly, it was a cumbersome action. I didn't enjoy it. Right. And so, you know, that lasted not very long. And uh, and not that it was the wrong thing to do, because once again, it's a ritual. If you did it, you'd probably be your vocal would be open, whatever. So I my conclusion for me, fueled by, you know, a love of minimalism and just being a bit lazy was I made a deal with myself of I'm not warming up anymore and I'm just going to be rad at it. And if I sleep, you know, a, a, an REM based sleep and a nice sleep, seven to eight hours, I can sing. And that's the rules I made for me. Um, yeah. And I abide by that. And if I, and if I drink a bunch of water before, you know, and if, you know, if I, and if, and, and most probably, and have a good attitude, you know? So, you know, there's a lot of ways, there's many ways to the mountain, I suppose, for everything, including vocals. But, um, you know, I just, you know, I just, I just show up and sing. Do you know who I saw sing last night? Rob Halford. Like, that's right. And? Did I tell you I was going to see Priest? I, I didn't, I thought that I didn't tell you. I was, it was going to be a big surprise. Yeah. Um, He's the best. Yeah. He's amazing. You know, he's awesome. Um, we went, you know, I was, I was hopeful we're in this house here, my home, we're a big, we're very, very big fans of Rockerola. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and I also, Sad Wings also, like those are my, those are my two favorites. And then, you know, I like, I like, I celebrate the catalog, but you know, Rob didn't write, wasn't involved in the writing of a lot of that first record. So they don't, they, I don't think they even did anything off that for Unleashed I heard they in the played East, Genocide right? last night. Is that yeah. right? But go on. Sorry oh, for interrupting. Well, we, uh, we split before the end of the show. I heard that, Glenn, like, is Glenn coming out and playing? He'll pop out, depending, for two songs, maybe. Right. What a treat. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the, I want to talk about the importance of Judas Priest to you. And also, like, Rob, Rob Halford sang on Goddamn Devil, like, an Ugly Kid Joe yeah. song. And so... Tell me, and that's like one of many, you know, relationships and sort of uh, interactions that you've had with people who you grew up admiring. And I want to, I want to talk about that stuff a little bit because we, you know, we cruise through this life of being musicians and brushing up against people who we've, you know, you play these festivals, you go on tour with bands and you know, you may or may not have actual meaningful relationships with people, but you often will interact with them and it's always a trip. And I, I guess I want to talk to you about that stuff. Um, okay. Because, because you've got, 
because there are there are some deep ones with you. Well, I'll tell you that the first Jewish priest story that I could share with you pertaining to um, the foundation of Ugly Kid Joe, let's say. I, as depicted before, was at Klaus's house, probably 14 years old. <laughs> and he put on, it's probably the first time I heard priest. And uh, he put on, his sister was corrupting us. It was awesome. We're listening to like, you know, Ozzy, Ozzy, you know, Diary of a Madman, Blizzard of Oz. We're listening to Sabbath yeah. proper. We were listening to Sabbath with Dio, Heaven and Hell, and all the priests you could imagine, ACDC. And I was like, oh, fuck, this is rad. Like it was touching me. I was feeling, and plus we were, you know, with the cool kids that were drinking beers and playing quarters and all that. But anyway, there was one night where Klaus put on, he goes, and I kept on peppering him and saying, I want to be the singer. Can I please be the singer? And he, he, he just, you know, he wouldn't really, he wouldn't really answer me. And I, you know, I kept on, and then he goes like one time he gets out the yellow priest record, Swinger for Vengeance, puts it on, that, you know, puts on the vinyl, takes the pendulum, puts it on and plays the entire record. And I'm like this, because that's a crazy record, right? And I'm like this. Oh, I yeah. can't really breathe. It's so fucking awesome. Like I'm. What a dramatic start. Yeah, it has. and I'm like, oh fuck. And then he goes like this at the end of the record. He goes like this. He all weird, methodical, Germanic, scientific, patient, kind. <laughs> he takes the album, German. puts it in the sleeve, puts it in the cardboard, and hands it to me. Slowly, it puts it in my hands, and I'm like this. I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm totally like freaked out of what I've just heard. And he goes, he leans in and says, when you can sing like that, I'll be in a band with you. <laughs> and I go, really? And I, he goes, yeah. And I go, and I, I didn't have my bike there for some reason. I ran. My mom's house is about, you know, 10 blocks away. And I ran, <laughs> ran long, with the record, ran to my mother's house. I couldn't breathe. And by then, my mom's a single mom, right? I couldn't breathe. And I was like, fuck. It was like, so, you know, this was it. He finally gave me a diff. If I could sing like this, he would do it, right? You know, because it, it, it was the first time he said anything vaguely. Like There was a goal. And I, just, I ran. I opened the door. My mom was reading the newspaper. And I can't breathe. And I'm mumbling. Kind of like, a, you know, kind of rain manish. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm a mom. And I'd be like half sentences, half, like using half sentences. Hey, Klaus. And the thing. And if this, I sing like this. And boom. It's gone. And it'll happen. <laughs> and she was like, Shh what are you talking about? I go, this is it. And she goes, let's listen to it. And, and my mom had, a, and I had convinced her to have this giant speaker stereo. Like I somehow convinced that. And I, and I played it loud. And she, she, and once again, she was so supportive of anything, including this moment that I showed any passion for that wasn't destructive, you know? Right. And we sat there and listened to it. And she was like, wow. And she's a musician. She's a pianist. And then that was the start of, me loving priest at that level and also having a gateway. Now, funny enough, uh, so and we'll go back to maybe some priest stories, but funny enough, so that did happen when we were 14. Now, funny enough, Klaus retained that, but I kind of forgot about it. So on this new album, we just uh, we have an album called uh, Red Wings of Destiny. It's about to come out and Ugly Kid Joe. And um, anyway, on that, on that album, there's a song called That Ain't Living. When I sing this high, that ain't living, Klaus thinks it sounds exactly like um free will burn and it's so cause i was in tahoe recently whenever i was there and he sent me snippets on a, on a text message he goes he goes you finally did it and i listened to both of those things and it is halford-esque you know with respect to Rob so is he gonna let you be in the band yeah i think i finally get to play with him. There it is. <laughs> but i did get there my point being is that at least by his gauge class x that's gauge um I did it. That's amazing. I want to talk. I want to talk about your your how you perceive your mother's perception of your story arc because she saw you go through a lot as a kid, sure. and you. I know we we and we don't even need to get into it, but I know you like like myself made a lot of trouble at school. <laughs> You weren't interested in school. No. You didn't care. It was bored. Like you had to make it fun for you, yourself. Yeah, yeah. And uh, sometimes that's not like, okay, I'm going to find a positive way to use my energy. A lot of times it's just like, it's bullshit kid stuff, yeah. right? You don't, uh, you don't know what to do, but your, your mom has 
has seen you do every like she's been standing by and being supportive through this entire journey yeah. of yours, yeah. which is incredible because you were a little shithead, right? That's saying it nicely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of conversations were you two having when your record was selling you know, 10,000 copies a week or whatever. Well, that was before cell phones and computers. So I wasn't talking to, you know, anybody. We were out there in the world with a fax machine. So I think she was right. just, I mean, for her, my sister, who's an awesome gal, um, she was like valedictorian of my high school, right? So when I went there, she, and she was four <laughs> years my senior, so <laughs> I'm serious. My family's, it's funny, but it's also true. So my family's super academic and they're all awesome people and that's their journey they, they love they love that shit and that's awesome and so you would have thought that maybe i would have been that too but i you know i guess you could call me the black sheep in, in some reference so anyway when my sister went she went off to uh berkeley and then she went off to stanford business school but when she left her senior year i came in the next year as a freshman in the same high school and and all the teachers were like no way we're crying you're you're the brother of kathy crane you must be and it took but 10 minutes to realize that it wasn't good <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't going to be that story, right? And um, so, you know. You were lighting off firecrackers and throwing them at their feet, and they were like, this is not. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, my, my, my mom had survived her own thing with the, you know, with, uh, with the, you know, with uh, just her innate life and her, her husband, my father. Um, so she, she, she was just surviving herself. You know what I'm saying? She. You know, I, and I only look at that now, and I'm 54 now, so I can see her more as a human being than as my mom. <laughs> that makes sense? Right. And so she was surviving herself, and she is such a – and she she came up in her own family that, you know, she'd have to tell you the story. But, you know, so her reaction to various things, some of them she was born into, some of them that she signed up to, her reaction has always been optimistic and survival survival-based. So I have that innately just from her. So past what we've talked about or what we're talking about during all that uh, initial success of Ugly Kid Joe, just, it just, just, you know, I figure it's what people do more than what they say that you're going to learn from. So, you know, my mom's a great currency of positivity. She always has been. So, but yeah, she survived me being the little shit, as you say. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, when you look at, and I'm objective about it, I think I have, I mean, people that end up in jail, people that end up dead for various reasons, and not bad bad guys, just, you know, guys that have overturned the apple cart, pushing it just a little too far. Sure. I was one of those dudes. And so for me to be collected by this musical journey, not only has been good for me, and yes, it's a, it's a perfect place for me to, to be. Like as whatever, whatever you want to define me as, as a human being, as an artist or singer or whatever, it's great for me. I'm really, you know, so grateful that I get to do it at all. But for her, you know, it went from when we were kids in Palo Alto, if you, if you had something happen at a party you had in high school and I wasn't even there, you could say to your parents, <laughs> Whit Crane did it. And the parents would go, yeah, of course. And that was just kind of like, my mom had to deal with that. You know, she was my mom and it wasn't the, there wasn't, it wasn't the most attractive gig. Right. But she still was surviving her own journey. Right. So for us right. to be, and that's just how it was. And I was, I was, you know, I was part of that problem. Um, so when we were successful and even when I'm alive today and still, you know, uh, being creative and, and alive and positive and, you know, grateful and all those things, um, she went from being, and I, I mean, I don't, I, this is what I see. I don't know, you know, you'd have to ask her, but I think she went from like probably being innately worried as a parent would be, as a mom would be, to now she's just proud. She's happy. She's like, wow, right on. You know, like it just worked out. So, you know, I would, I'm so happy about that for her, you know? Yeah. I imagine that a, like when Ugly Kid Joe, blew up and was peaking when like in 90 with the conventional ways, right? Like big tours, MTV, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. 
some of those worries were still present because there's a lot of carrying on for a 24 year no, old. No, she wouldn't. No, she wouldn't have tripped on that. No. Uh, really? No. She, no, she's pretty. No, she wouldn't have tripped on that. She's pretty like, you know, mathematical, like you, you do it or don't, Yeah. you know, better, <laughs> you know, yeah. like she's, she's not, she's, she's not someone who's going to fret. Right. She's a, she's, she's a, her reaction once again, historically is positive, but you'd have to ask her. I've never seen fear yeah. in her. Right. I hope to get to meet her. She's cute. Yeah. I bet. Okay, so I don't, I, we we got off on this stuff about how, how your mom felt about you, yeah. and uh, I wanted to talk about when you got to work with Rob Halford, when you got to work with Ozzy, like all, and when you got to work with Lemmy, all these people who you grew up idolizing, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden Whit Crane had arrived, and how did how did that feel, and what kind of voices? were talking to you inside your own head well with ugly kid joe we made that ep which was called ugly as they want to be which sold a shit ton of of units or albums or cds it wasn't that great a body of music anyway but it was really successful so that all of a sudden you know it was record breaking was it not i think it was it sold Is a it bunch of fucking albums yeah i believe it's the great the highest selling ep well, I think that, that, as far as a debut EP, it did really good. Got it. And so because of that, you know, and we got a record deal. We didn't even know what that was. We were very excited. We made this EP. It sold a fucking shit ton of albums. Uh, and we, you know, we any interview that uh, Klaus and I would do, we, all we would tell them is that Ozzy rules. We'd say Ozzy rules. And we'd have Ozzy on our knuckles. And we'd go like that. We loved Ozzy. Right. Because we love Ozzy, right? But we love Priest. So... When we had the opportunity, they really, the label, Mercury Polygram, really wanted us to go in immediately and understandably go make a body of new music, a full album. And they said to us, because the EP was so successful, they're like, let's get in the studio, let's go. So they asked us, everybody asked us, do you guys have all the songs? And we said, yes, of course we do, which of course we didn't. And right. we went, we started vetting producers. And one of the producers that we were able to go meet at a studio called Devonshire, uh, his name was Mark Dodson. And why did we want to meet Mark Dodson? For me, it was because he worked with Priest. <laughs> he worked on Sin After right. Sin, and he worked on uh, uh, he worked on uh, Defenders of the Faith. Wow. And I don't even know what production is. I don't know what a studio is. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't understand any of it. But somebody knows Priest. Right. That's all I cared about. And so we went in there. Mark was back there on this giant knee board at the Devonshire studio. We me and Klaus walked in, young, like twenty three, probably twenty three years old. And Mark was smoking marble reds. And we just stared at him. There he was, you know, this legendary dude, that, you know, that worked with Priest. And I just looked at him. I go, "Did you know?" As a name, as before that moment, he was a name on a record sleeve. I don't know. I didn't. I just. I didn't even look at that shit. I don't know what a snare drum sounds like. Or I didn't. I don't know. I didn't. I don't get it. But right. I want to be close to Priest. So I looked at him, and me and Cus kind of stared at him. We're like, hmm. And he looked right at us. He's English. He's hilarious. And and he goes, "Hey, boys." And I go. Did you really work with Priest? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. <laughs> and, and he goes, yeah, sin after sin and defenders of the faith. I go, you're the guy. And Mark Costa's like, calm down, calm down. I go, no, he's for sure the guy. He worked with Priest. And, uh, and of course, you know, I'm that guy. He's the guy for no good reason, right? And, uh, of course, we did make a record with Mark. And Mark did work on those albums. And at the time, I was dating a, the MTV J. Her name's Karen Duffy, one of the great live loves of my life. And she was in New York. And I think Halford was rolling through while we were making America's Least Wanted. Halford rolled through, uh, I think he was promoting fight maybe or whatever he was doing. And, 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 you know, my girlfriend at the time, Karen, she, she, I tortured her with priest. I would just make her listen to priest all day long. So she was like, you know, my boyfriend lives for you. And then Mark Dodson, uh, went at his angle and we're making the album. And so we got the word out to Rob Halford, you know, we would love for you to come down and sing on this track or a track. And he showed up. And he was awesome and kind and present and uh, beautiful vocabulary. And, uh, and he was the metal god. And we put, it was Ampex 456. That's tape. It's before the computers. Yeah, yeah. And so the Ampex, the Ampex 456 goes like that. And it's Goddamn Devil, which has some pretty awesome satanic lyrics. <laughs> and we, you know, you push, you push, the, push the button and it's playing on the big speakers. And we're all sitting there as kids we're like this. 
just looking at Rob Halford. And Rob Halford's fucking, he's a super pro. He, he goes like this, and he was listening. Listening like I've never listened to anything. Like, he was inside music at a level that I'd never seen. Like, he's magical. He listens to the whole song, and it's over. And we're kind of looking at him like, wow. And he, and he looks over at Klaus and goes, I like the lyrics. <laughs> and we're like, yes! And well, do you want to sing on it? And he's like, yes. And they went in the, you know, into the, the room. Just, there's the need board, there's the glass, and that's where you'd sing. And he walked in, and I got to kind of produce him. I got to push the button and say a little more like this, a little more like that. And to watch that dude. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. You were talking to him on the talk back. Yeah. And saying a little more like this, a little more like that. Well, yeah, what I, what I would really, think, like it's a, I have to imagine you're you're coaching him. You're what you're asking for. Will you sing it a little bit more like screaming? Yeah, for yeah vengeance. whatever, whatever I was saying. Right. Like Mark just <laughs> went like this. That's your Dotson went like this. It's up to you, bro. There's the button. I go just like this. I never pushed that button before. I'm like, hey man, can you hear me? And he's all, I can hear you. I'm all, fuck yeah, this is awesome. And I saw him. I saw what a real vocalist would do in a studio. I saw someone that was so next level and it all kind of made sense to me. I'm okay. That's why he is the fucking king of it all. Right. Um, right. and he sang it. He was super radical. Then he, you know, he came back out and then we went to Indian food <laughs> and it was awesome. We hung out. Did he go to Indian food with you guys? Yeah, or yeah, no? yeah. We all went to Indian food. It was awesome. And um, he came out during that tour. We, I think by 93, we went out with Def Leppard and we played in Phoenix. He came, sang with us live in Phoenix on the uh -huh. stage. And, uh, and was, you know, they're just, the Priest guys are so fucking cool. Like, they're great fucking right. guys. Tipton's super cool. KK's awesome. Alfred's the man. I don't know Ian Hill very well. Uh, spent, I'm friends with Scott Travis. Uh, never met uh, Holland. Never met Les Banks. But, you know, it's a, it's a formative band for for us but, but back to like like when i was in the studio inclusive to that story i was having a tough time because the studio was not my environment no way like i was i, I kicked that right. live and i was you know i could kind of do that but the studio overwhelmed me like just the size of the board looked like this oppressive machine and having to be separated from your band and not playing with your band so when I was able, so I was, you know, I, I was being um, problematic in the studio. Like I was like, this is stupid. Like I was a kid. I was a, you know, like a, and so when I well, saw I think Halford, the, the studio feels institutional, like a school, that, like, so there's only a minimal part of the studio that feels performance based. The rest of it is technical. Stuff, right. So right? that didn't make me feel comfortable. And I was whinging about it. So when I was able to see, so I agree with you, uh, when I was able to see Halford transcend that, no problem. I didn't magically do that the next day, but I realized it could be done. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? Wow. First full length record, Rob Halford. Isn't that right? Like what a treat. He that was that was the benchmark by which for your entry point into being in a band. Yeah. What um, what was Klaus doing? Was his jaw just on the floor or was he doing his best to play it cool? Well, Klaus at that time was the most, maybe to this day, was the most grounded one in the band. You know, he was the primary yeah. songwriter for that album. So he was actually kind of being scientific and kind of, I mean, you'd have to talk to him and ask him. I've never really asked him what he was going through. I think we just kind of look, those kinds of things, like we, you know, so we grew up together. We took bong hits in the park when we were 13. Like, and all of a sudden right. we're like, really? You know? <laughs> and so, so like, I think for the most part with Klaus, our, our stuff's been like kind of unsaid. Like, we'll go like this. Like, in moments like that, I'll be all... And it's all said in a little one look, like, holy fuck. But right. you have to ask Klaus what he thought. I don't know. You went on to have, I mean, obvious, the record blew up, big hits, videos, big budgets, tours, etc. But you went on, more importantly, you went on to have personal relationships with other people who you had admired for years. Yeah. and like Ozzy and Lemmy, um, there's a part of us that you set a goal and you're like, I want to do this because I see other people doing it and it looks fucking rad, right? Yeah. I see Eddie Van Halen and David Lee Roth doing this shit and look how fucking awesome it is. Okay. But then, you know, when you arrive, 
you there's a uh, how much did you have to convince yourself because you have to believe you belong there and then once you're there it's a it's a trip because look at look where i am i'm in the place now now i'm there tell me about that part of your experience as you guys were sort of like going up and as you're meeting folks and and uh, having real relationships with them well uh you know once again the ep is very popular we got in the studio we recorded uh american east wanted the big push uh that record became successful uh and within before its success even manifested like we got the aussie motorhead tour in the states which is fucking awesome and we went out with those with those bands, but we were young. We were 23, 24. We were overturning apple carts. You know, those guys loved us though. Okay. And we loved them back. You know, we certainly weren't a threat. We were more like, I think they've kind of like, like all those kind of guys, like uh, Lemmy pulled me aside. I think Ozzy pulled me aside sometime, but all independently and some other people uh, that would have similar stations. They've all, especially when I was like 25, 24, 25, they independently, they would pull me aside, these various characters, and they'd say, and I'd be so hyper because I was so excited about it all. And they'd go, calm down. I'd right. go, what's up? And they'd say, you just missed it. <laughs> you know, I'd go, what did I miss? And they're like, I think they're talking about the 70s. I think they, I think they saw in me and what, whatever the band was, the energy of us. They, I think that there was a, a different landing that was kind of meant for us, but we landed here, you know, kind of like in a different time dimension. Um, funny enough, hindsight being, I mean, we're actually kind of a, part of a, a golden age, you know, when MTV would play your videos and you could go kick ass. So I think we're, we landed quite well, but as far as getting to go tour with those guys and, you know, um, I would, I was hanging out with Lemmy once at his apartment in, um, in Hollywood. He had an apartment right near the rainbow and we're talking mad, 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 mad philosophy and just rock and roll stuff. And I, I would always ask him when I was, when I felt, cause you know, that old journey, even now I felt out of my depth, which I think is actually an awesome place to be because it means you're alive, but still it's daunting. So I'd ask Lemmy all these questions about, you know, where, what is all this and what all this. And so that, that's a different story. But, but I remember I, I looked at him and, uh, and I said, Hey man, just so you know, you know, I had a, a really, you know, kind of interesting childhood and my dad's kind of out of the picture. And I said, I, uh, so, so you and Oz, you guys are kind of like my, um, I mean, with respect, you guys are kind of like my father figures. And he gave me a big, long, let me look. And he goes, I'd like to think of us more as brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how he saw it and that's how i saw it from that day on you know what i mean so right i mean those guys are just really i mean birmingham england is an awesome place if you think of what it's birthed right right um you know we klaus and i uh a, a sibling to priest we love ozzy osborne i mean he is we, we, we we're so psyched on ozzy we love you know, everything from Jakey Lee stuff to Zach Wilde stuff, Randy stuff, you know, whatever. Like, we're in. I mean, yeah, particularly we loved Iron Man Man and Blizzard of Oz. Like, that shit we fucking played forever. We, like, you know, you know, you know, when you go through tapes, you know, we played it that much. You wear it out, so, stretch the tape, you know, tape, whether it be Lamb it, or it Oz, uh, you know, and from that tour, from the No More Tours tour in 1992, I became friends with those dudes independently. So, to this day, I mean, all the way to when Lem left us, you know, I would go visit him. I would call him and I would love him because he's awesome. And he was a very wise man, you know, he was um, an honorable guy. I look at Lemmy like he's like, okay, there's the myth, which you're, I imagine you're aware of. There's the myth of rock and roll, which is dangerous and could easily kill you. And then there's the very rare outlier, which I would like to call the myth maker. Like Lemmy's a myth maker. Keith Richards is a right. myth maker. Bon Scott was a myth maker, right? So it's really fun. And then, you know, I talk, I mean, I won't go through, through the idiosyncrasies of the conversation because I just won't talk about that, but I will give you broad strokes. You know, that would turn me on to a lot of wisdom of where I was at, what I was involved in, you know, um, and I would really listen. And he really shared with me. And, he, and I was like, wow. And it was so cool. We had a wonderful connection, you know, and, uh, that motorhead camp is just fucking awesome. Like their crew, I mean, it was a yeah. family and, uh, yeah. you know, I would get to go sing with motorhead. Like I, up in 2012 and 2014, I showed up with my backpack to the motorhead bus and said, can I go on tour with you? 
but not as a band, just as a weird guy with the backpack. And they all said, yeah, get on the bus. Right. So, you know, through the history of, of my relationship with Motorhead, um, I've been invited to sing on stage with them probably 20 times, you know, and that's pretty cool. Because Motorhead's a three piece. At this, at the, recently, it's been a three piece. So you're you, you front Motorhead. And the, the cool thing about their, which is interesting, I almost want to do it, but you know, I, I probably just leave it here. But whenever they they you know that would say, I, you know, I suppose you'd like to come sing tonight. And I'd be like, fuck yeah, yes I do. And then the the Motorhead crew, they I don't know, I don't know if you've looked at the seventies much. But I'm sure you have. I have, but I've never had it in my hand except in these stories. They take an SM58. It's plugged in the back. Then the cord's wrapped around back on, and then it's duct taped. It looks like something Roger Dalton would hold. But that's yeah. the mic they'd give me. No mic stand, that's what you get. Which, of course, that's what you get. And I always thought to myself, okay, if they really are that they, they're putting me back in the 70s, because that's what they see. Not that they told me that, but my inference would have been that. So that's pretty cool, you know? And um, that's a big loss, but I'm, uh, for, that, that, that's gone. But what a great, um, a wondrous currency it, it was to, to know him at all. Yeah. Yeah. It occurred to me um, later on in the conversation that the new record, which is called Rad Wings of Destiny, yeah. it's which is a play on Sad Wings of Destiny, of course, yeah. a Judas Priest record. It occurred to me that it's very ironic that Klaus recognized you finally sang like what he perceives on the level with Halford on an album called Rad Wings oh, wow. of Destiny. I just put that together too. <laughs> just it's, now. It's pretty funny. No, no, right? I didn't put that together till right now. Yes, that's awesome. How rad is that? You're rad. Uh let's talk about let's talk about that record. Rad Wings? Yeah. Well we made a record with Dave Fortman in 2015, which was called um, 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 Uglier Than They Used To Be, and we toured that, and that was kind of a darker, more evil album. Like, we didn't even play songs of it live, you know? You, you never know, like, you don't really know, when you're making an album, I, we did, we've never had, like, let's go make an album like this or that. We don't, we're not that thought out. We just show up, throw a bunch of songs in the middle, and then whatever wins, wins. So, this album, for whatever reason, is more, it has, it has a, it has a, a more rock and roll fun vibe about it compared to the last album. So I believe that we'll play a bunch of songs off this record, which is awesome and, and uh, yeah. exciting to do so. Um, we called it Rad Wings of Destiny because we love Judas Priest and we say rad every fifth word. That is the impetus of that. Um, and we all wrote songs and we, we all met in um, Santa Barbara, did some pre-production. Then we flew the band and that included Zach Wilde, I'm not Zach Waltz, you mean Zach Morris. Excuse me, Zach Morris. Uh, it, it included Klaus Eichstadt, Dave Foreman, Cordell Crockett, myself, and then Mark Dodson, the producer, who produced America's Least Wanted. So it's a big full circle thing. And equally, uh, I've, I've got a dear friend named Jeff Curran. He's a guitar player out of Australia, and he plays in a band with me called Yellow Cake out of Melbourne, Australia. And so he flew to come do this too. So like, Everyone's in Santa Barbara. Then we took the whole bag of tricks and we went to um, El Paso, Texas, to a studio by the name of Sonic Ranch, which is in the middle of a pecan farm next to Juarez, Mexico, middle of nowhere. An amazing spot. You stay. You you live there. There's there's all, there's all kinds of studios in there. There's all kinds of sick little pockets of studios. So there's other bands there. There's these wonderful women that cook you three meals a day. They make their own hot sauce in a blender. And there's like Picasso's on the wall. There's Salvador Dali on the wall. It's the best gear I've ever seen in one place at one time. If you're if particularly a right-handed guitar player, it's the best guitar. You could just show up. It's the best bevy of guitars I've ever seen in my life. The rooms are incredible. Um, they're all Neve board. It's all old school analog shit. And it's fucking awesome. And so we all went there. As we sat there, Shannon Larkin, who lives in Florida, flew himself to the process showed up said hey what's up i said hey shannon so great to see you we love you and he's i love you too and i go how much did your plane flight cost and he goes you I, he's like you're not paying me shit and i go why is that he goes because i love you i go wow man right on shannon so 
So Shannon tracked, you know, everyone was there. A family's there. No one's, you know, it, like, kind of, you get how we work because you're, you're, you jam with us now. So everyone's, yeah. it's my dream, which didn't exist funny enough in, in the early nineties. It's like, I have a family, I have peers and it's, it's, and it's, a, it's awesome. And Mark Dodson's there. And we made this record and we, you know, we put songs in the middle. Jeff Curran, he played on um, uh, That Ain't Living because I wrote it with him. That Ain't Living, and he played banjo on Drinking and Driving. Shannon played on That Ain't Living. He played on Lola. He played on Dead Friends Play. He played on um, <clears throat> Up in the City. Um, and then Zach played the rest of it. But it was just such a badass experience. And then, but we didn't finish it. We didn't finish it all in three weeks. So That Ain't Living vocal was not done. The Lola vocal was not done. And somehow I ended up living in Lisbon, Portugal <clears throat> in just, uh, November, late November of uh, 2019. And Mark Dodson was back in London. So I flew, I think December 8th, I flew 2019. I flew to London, got a hotel and went and sang those two tracks in London. Um, and that completed that part of the album. And um, it's been a really good process. Then came the pandemic. Right, so everything was all chuka chuka chuka. Woo woo, we're going, and then just like right. anybody, for various reasons, everything was like you're not going anywhere. So we, you know, we 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 went off into our various ethers, and you know, uh, got back together uh, in the sense of like, let's okay, now let's get it going. And then the song, um, the two songs. Uh, there's only at that point we only had eight songs done on the album, which is fine to me. I love the number eight. And all those old albums from the 70s have eight songs. <clears throat> but nobody really likes it when I say that, even though I, I try to sell that right. all the time. Nobody likes it. And I, I, I honor that. But um, So I went this year, what is it, 2022? I went in January, and it was like a couple days in February, and I went, and I have songs, I have endless songs in my head, even now. And I went to Florida, where Dave lives in Fort Myers, Fort Myers and uh, pre-Hurricane, and um we tracked, he's like, what do you got? He's, he's a wondrous producer. He's really great at, and patient at getting what's in my head out of my head. You know, I don't play. It's in there, though, it's right between here. And, uh, and so we tracked, you know, he, we got the skeleton of, uh, of um, Dead Friends play and um, Up in the City, and then Shannon Larkin played on it, and we, there you go. So we have two more songs for the record, album, CD tape. And that's the album, Rad Wings of Destiny. And it comes out um, on October 21st, uh, 2022. And uh, we're going to go tour uh, some dates in the UK. And uh, we're excited. I am I, I am excited as we are excited. Yeah. It's going to be great. Yeah, man. Um, I think that it's some of the, some of your best stuff. Oh, wow. Thank you. And um, so... It's um, one interesting thing for me is that you don't play guitar, but you have all these ideas and you track, like you don't travel with a computer, you have an iPhone and you have hundreds of audio files of you just going, do, 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 and then, and then you bounce the piano now, I don't find you know, whatever it is, and then you singing with it. Yeah. And I imagine you play that back and work on a vocal melody, and then you record the vocal melody in a separate thing, and you're like, all right, let's do a song. I don't let's, do it This like is that. a song. Well, it's... <laughs> okay. Um, how were you doing... How were, were you able to preserve ideas sometimes i'd come up that. with a riff and i'd have my phone with me so yes i would track the you know dun, 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 and i fact that's rap. right and i usually so in costa rica where i wrote most of the songs that live in my head now uh if i was going to the gym i would have my phone with me because i want to listen to music later but if i do, if i'm not going to the gym i don't bring this phone outside so then i would play a game with myself which are probably good for your mind is I would cruise out and I still do this. I cruise out, like I'll go walking Brighton, but I won't bring this phone and whether it be a vocal line or a guitar line, I'll come up with it and think, God damn it. I wish I had my phone, but I purposely don't have it. So then I have to retain it to get all the way back here, which could take whatever amount of time. Then I tape it. And if it makes it back to the phone, it's awesome. 
And if it doesn't, then maybe it wasn't that awesome. While you're traveling back to your phone, are you also sort of refining yeah. it or are you 100%. just repeating it? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Always refining. Were you one of those folks that would call your own answering machine before iPhones no. were around? No. Or how did you how did you preserve your ideas then? Well, or then I was not? like maybe 15% awesome, 85% shit. I mean, just in general. <laughs> so those guys, you know, those guys were like really, I, was, I got a fucking red eye and I was so intense and, and like too, a little too much energy for anybody. But those guys have always been really kind with me, very patient. And they go, and they, right. they used to get my riff and some of my riffs would make it like a 15 percentile. But I've now through time and space and experience, I've, I, I believe that I've become like the other way around. So I'm not an 85% radness, but I'm more like, you know, 60 to 70 in there. And then the other, uh, all of the rest of it is shit. But it's, it's to the point where those guys believe me more, which, right. which, which, which is predicated on proof. Like they're like, okay, we believe Craig. And so that is, um, you need, I mean, you can't, unless you're a comedian, you can't front the band alone. Right. Sure. So, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've slowly find in my way. Like I went in the studio yesterday with my buddy, Chris, to try, I'm tracking new, I'm, I'm working on yellow cake songs right now. Right. I'm going to bring Jeff Kern over. I'm going to meet him in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Palm desert and, uh, in the, in the coming year. And, um, so I'm writing for that and I, in, and I'm ready to go. So I went to the studio yesterday and, you know, if there's a producer in the studio with me, I'm going to be quiet and let a producer produce respect. Right. You know, but if no one's there, I'm not scared to go jump in the deep end and get, and I know exactly what I want, not exactly till that moment. Like I'm really good. Or at least I think I am, or, or I have the possibility to be super present and saying, what about this and have it just, and so that's been happening lately. You know, it happened with Dave when we made those two songs. It have So I think I'm in a sweet spot, at least for me, comparatively speaking to historically how I could get it out the great battle between my ears and now how it's coming out, not effortlessly, but it has a, it has a way out now that seems doable. Right. What, um, as you look at the next year to two years, what are you most excited about? Or do you look that far ahead? Mm -hmm. I'm excited right now. Life is awesome today. Um, right. What I do is I pick like what I would, what I would call maybe cornerstones, right? Um, and I like, you know, for, for instance, there's a cornerstone of the tour that's coming up. And I'll, so I'll water all those roots to make sure that that could be a solid, awesome experience. Doesn't mean it's going to be awesome, but it means it could be, right? And after that, it where am I be. going, right? So I'm going to go live outside of Brighton. So I have those pieces of the puzzle, which are just, those are, cornerstones of what I'm going to do. And then everything else fills in. So that's what I do. But other than that, no, I don't, I'm not, you know, I let stuff fill in. Right. Yeah. All right. Ugly kid. Joe has a tour through the UK for about, it's about 12. We meet, 12 you and I will meet in Leeds, which is the UK. We meet on, um, I'll probably see you on, uh, October 30th. 31st and 1st of November. And then we start touring. We have right here in, um, yeah. in this. We'll, we'll do a little world gig there. It'll be fun, hopefully. And then we'll tour through the 11th. And then I will fly away out of this country. Where do you plan to go? Hawaii. Where? Hawaii. You're going to Hawaii? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It'll be a great time of year to be there. Really awesome. Yeah, I'm going to go. I got some friends now on the North Shore. Um, mm -hmm. and they're really awesome people and it's a good, it's a good, it's a good setup, you know, nice. you'll have a little bicycle, cruise around, jump in the water, get that salt, get, yeah. get the salt, get that, uh, good vibration, you know? Yeah. Wit. Yeah. I love you so much. I love you back. You're rad. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm so excited to, to be on tour again with you. I owe you a debt of gratitude. Uh, um, I've, this year has been an amazing year for me. 
And it's because you invited me into your world. It's because we met backstage uh, in Wales. You know what I realized? Uh, and I've been telling this story for, for a while. Yeah. And I realized it's not true. Because when we met uh, on the Alice Cooper tour, I said to you, if you ever need someone, I'm your, um, I'm your guy. Yeah. I'll go. Yeah. Like, and I've been telling people the only band that I've ever been invited to, to join to, on stage, like the invited to play yeah. with, was Ugly Kid Joe. And I kind of invited myself. <laughs> every, every band that I've ever played with, I've been like, hey, what about me? Yeah. No one's ever been, you know who we need? Mike Squires. Let's get him. Yeah, it's been, isn't it nice? I mean, isn't, <laughs> once again, music is the currency for these collective experiences. And we could, and I would meet you for dinner or a cup of coffee, wherever. We would, we could right. do that. I would do that. I love you, right? But meaning to we go We have to, done that uh, outside of music. But, yeah, of course. But meaning for a musical journey is awesome. What a thing to do. Yeah. You know, and, then, and don't forget our crew. And don't forget the people we're going to see. And we might even see Gus. Dude, I've been fighting for Gus. What's that? I've been fighting for Gus. Oh, is he going to be there? Yeah, I, I text him. I've never text. I've never, ever, once, understandably, text a bus driver from a European tour in my life. Because they're not usually very rad, right? We love, for your right. listeners, we have, a, we have a bus driver named Gus, and we love him. Squires and I love like Gus. Gus isn't even his real name. We we named him. I named him Gus because it rhymed with bus. I don't no, know no, you his real because name. he was born in August. Oh, that's right. And he was going to be. But it anyway, it's a different story. Bus. But anyway, so I've said, "Hey, bro, we're just going out for this." And he's all. And so Gav's on it. The the jumbo cruiser guys, like you know, whatever. But as far as as you know, you can't make things happen, but you can nudge them. You can nurture the idea. There's a chance that not only will we have Gav and Soldier and Tashi. And uh, and Gary and the band, but there's a chance we'll have Gus. That's nice. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Here's what so I much. just so you know, if that happens, I'll tell you this. This is an odd thing that uh, you know. I don't really want any things or a gift to say. I don't want any things, so no things. Thank you. Right. I respect people that love stuff, but I don't need any more stuff. But anyway, let's say this with kid gloves. I ended up with this great big white towel on that tour. Right. Yeah. Right. I ended up with it. <laughs> right. right. It's but it's the greatest right. towel. Like if 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 so, if some of your uh, listeners or viewers like, do you agree, Mike Squires? Do you agree that a clean, awesome, beautiful towel? There's a currency to that on the road, right? That's a real commodity. Right. So, on so, the so road. anyway, so I had I, I was lugging this towel. It's giant. It's the greatest towel that I ended up with. And right. um, and you don't covet very no, many no, I love things. This towel. Like a and I wouldn't. And I, of course, it's too. It's too bulky, and I can't bring it with me on my real journey. So I looked at Gus when he dropped us off at uh, the Gatwick Airport. And I go, hey, Gus, it's really nice to meet you. And he's all, you too, man. It was a real good connection. And then I, of course, used that as a bridge to, I go, I got it. I'm going to ask you something, bro. And he goes, you ask me anything with Craig. I go, this is my favorite towel ever. And he goes, is it? I go, will you keep it for me? And he goes, I'll keep it for you, my friend. So... My dream is this. If there's a ch now, if he, if he, if the towel doesn't exist, so be it. But there is this great chance of things that I look forward to in this life. If Gus manifests and he's our bus driver, yay, right? But if he goes like this, it's great to see you. It hands me that towel. That to me will be a wondrous, awesome, next level moment. That will, that'll be pretty magical. Right. I don't. I mean, that's not like uh, Rob Halford in the studio, but it's kind of, in some ways, better for me. That's what I truthfully get excited about in life. That <laughs> seriously. Uh, I am. I'm so looking forward to this. I'm so excited for it. The record is so great. Awesome, man. Um. Everything, everything about it is is awesome. You're singing at at you're thriving. Your voice is thriving. Thank you. So, I don't I don't have anything else to say about it. That's okay. It's rad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my dog is starting to cry. I do. And it's lovely to I see you. I think this is a good place for us to stop. Um, okay, man. Th thank you for having me on your um. 
your 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 podcast. I'm grateful, and you're awesome, and I believe in you. I believe in Bye, you. Buddy. Uh, I'm going to see you in two Bye, weeks. Buddy. I'm going to turn this off. Don't hang up until you see it says 100%, okay? So don't touch anything. <laughs>